I, I maybe don't need to do an introduction. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, let's welcome Robert Reich to Politics and Prose. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> well, it's so nice to see you. I can actually see you. Uh, it is, I love politics and prose uh, for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that I, when I do a, a book tour and I come here, I see so many people I've worked with before. Uh, and it reminds me how old I am. <laughs> you guys are not that old. Uh, but Bert Four, uh, Bert, where are you? I mean, Bert, you go, I mean, you, we were working in the Federal Trade Commission in the, which administration? Carter administration. And, uh, and who, is anybody here from the Justice Department during the Ford administration? <laughs> They're all in hiding. Uh, anyway, uh, it's wonderful to see you, and I'm so pleased you're here. And uh, uh, that, how can I begin? The best way of beginning, I, I wrote a book uh, that is the reason I'm here. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going around the country flogging this book, uh, but, I, but I really believe very much in it, and I wouldn't be spending the time uh, if I didn't believe in it. But the title, I, I've been interested. I've been on the road for just a, a few days, and already people come to me and they say, well, there's two uh, kind of reactions to the title. Some people say, uh, well, what's, why the saving capitalism? Cap you, act, you know, that sounds, that, that suggests that capitalism needs saving. Uh, it's what's wrong with it? And then there's another group that says, why would you ever want to save capitalism? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I sort of, I figure, well, I, I antagonized everybody, so it must be the right title. Uh, but the subtitle is actually more important in a way, and that is, uh, for the many, not the few. Uh, and that's the key uh, to the book. Uh, for uh, about 35 years, uh, I have been writing about widening inequality in the United States uh, most of the time. I assumed that the major reason that inequality is widening is because you've got two big forces. One is globalization, the other is technological change, and if you're on the wrong side of the educational divide, uh, you are really in trouble because of globalization and technological change, but if you're on the right side, uh, you're doing very well. And that was my thesis in the work of Nations in 1991, and I've sort of uh, I kind of kept that and elaborated on it and done more and more with it. Uh, but a few years ago, and I think it was uh, when I was down in Washington uh, for something, or here in Washington for something, I began thinking that I was leaving out a big and important factor. I think it was actually about, uh, about eight or nine years ago, I started thinking about uh, the, the politics and power that accrue to people who are obviously the winners, uh, a small group of winners in terms of wealth and income. And if I didn't actually examine and put power and politics into the equation, I was missing a big part of the, of the story. And it was pretty, I mean, saying it right now to you, it, it sounds pretty obvious. Uh, but to me, eight or nine years ago when I started to think about it, it was not all that obvious. Uh, but what I noticed is that certain things that I had predicted in 1991 uh, had come to pass. That is, I said in 1991, uh, did anybody, does anybody remember that book? I, oh, one of you. <laughs> You know, I, uh, the first book I ever read, uh, wrote, wrote you know, I, I went to a, a political fundraiser about, uh, about a year ago, and that book, not The Work of Nations, a book before that, was on the shelf, uh, the hardback of the fundraiser. And I said, that's amazing. I, I can't believe you have that book. Nobody has that book. That's, <laughs> and he looked, uh, the fundraiser, the person, uh, looked very abashed. And, and I said, why, you look a little bit embarrassed. He said, well, pull it, pull it out and open it. And I pulled it out and opened it and it, it was a safekeeping device. The, the, whole, the, whole, the whole inside was, was hollowed out. And I suppose on the theory that nobody would ever pull it out. I mean, that, so anyway, I'm glad that, that at least we have one person who read the, uh, the Work of Nations. But in the Work of Nations, uh, the prediction was that if you were, I call them symbolic analysts, if you were really adept at analyzing symbols, 
uh, you would do very, very much better. If you were a routine production worker, you'd be replaced by globalization, uh, people abroad, or by technology, software. And if you were a personal service worker, that is, where the essence of what you did was to give somebody else a personal service, retail, restaurant, hotel, uh, hospital, uh, child care, elder care, you would be getting a job, but it would just pay very, very little. Uh, so that prediction in 1991 wasn't far off the mark, but here's where I blew it. I assumed that the wages of college graduates would continue to rise. Actually, starting in 2000, the median wage of college graduates started to actually drop. And recent college graduates, uh, about, uh, well, about 48, 49 percent of them are doing work that doesn't even require a college degree. So in other words, college, a university degree, is no longer the avenue to upward mobility that it was years ago. So I started to think, wait a minute, there's something odd there. And then something else struck me about really starting 15 years ago, and that was that the, the compensation of CEOs was going bonkers. I mean, it was so much out of line with the compensation of everybody else. And you probably all know the data uh, that in the 1960s, the typical CEO was earning 20 times what the average worker was earning. And now we're up to about 300 times in large companies. Uh, and then I started to look at other data. Uh, other countries don't have nearly the inequality we do and also have, don't have nearly the economic insecurity we have. And yet, they are subjected to the same forces of globalization and technological change. So, in other words, it was like it, it, it was like a black hole in space. You know, there was there was I could see something happening, uh, and I didn't figure out until a few years ago in my research for this book what that was. And again, let me stress to you, what it is is a vicious cycle in which. Those who are very wealthy and who have very high incomes, many of them CEOs, many of them involved in executive positions, many of them on Wall Street, uh, some of them billionaires, uh, have, and not all of them, but a number of them, have used their wealth and their power and their influence to get rule changes, changes in laws, that actually improve their odds of doing even better. And that gives them even more leverage to get more rule changes that enable them to do even better. That vicious cycle became very apparent as I started to research the book. And again, saying it, it now must seem quite obvious, but it wasn't that obvious. Uh, what I base this book on, I've, I, there are three related myths that I am trying to bust for a reason that I will get to in a moment. Myth number one is that there is something called a free market that is different and distinct from government. Uh, and I tell you, for years, I get up uh, and debate people either on television or radio or in person, and no matter who it is I debate, a conservative or Republican usually, uh, within four minutes, and no matter what the topic is, it could be everything from, uh, well, uh, eating disorders to, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, to religious conviction or to, I mean, it doesn't matter. It, it, and within four minutes, the issue becomes, do you trust government or do you trust the market? And I realized how dangerous that debate is because it's a fatuous debate. You cannot have a market without government. Uh, there is no such thing as a free market in nature. I mean, there, it's all survival of the fittest, usually the biggest and heaviest and strongest just wins. A civilized society has a market economy, but that market is defined by rules. And those rules are everything from property all the way through what can be traded, all the way through what happens when you can't pay up, all the way through liability. I mean, these are, these are basic building blocks of capitalism. And different nations have different building blocks, and the building blocks change over time. I mean, there was a time in American society, and certainly around the world, when property was, well, one form of property was slavery. Uh, norms change, politics changes. Now the central property we have in this economy is called intellectual property. 
But that intellectual property is not obvious. I mean, certain things qualify as intellectual property and other things don't. I mean, the genome, can you, can you patent the genome? Well, to some extent you can. Other countries say no. Uh, what about uh, the ability to trade or sell babies? Or what about the ability to trade or sell votes? Or what about, uh, you, you get my drift. Uh, I also was very interested in one aspect of contract law and policy, which has to do with fraud. Because, again, the definition of fraud is politically determined. It's determined by administrative agencies, by judges, uh, by legislatures. And one particular part of fraud that's very important in terms of understanding Wall Street is insider trading. We in this country have the loosest rules of any major advanced nation on what constitutes insider trading. If I'm a CEO and I know that my company is just about to do something that's going to have a major effect on our share price, uh, that's insider information. I can't trade on it. But what if I tell my golfing buddy and my golfing buddy then calls up his friend uh, who's a hedge fund manager and that hedge fund manager makes a huge bet on the basis of that insider information and makes hundreds of millions of dollars as soon as my company actually does it. Uh, is that illegal? Well, it turns out it is legal in the United States. It is not legal in most other countries. And we could go, and I, and I discuss property, contract, a lot of other things. Uh, so the first big fallacy, the first big mythology is that there's a market that is separate from government, and that's what we ought to talk about. No, we ought to talk about whether the market government system, the political economy, is working for most of us or for a small number at the top. That's the real debate we should be having. The market versus government debate is a distraction. It keeps us apart. Liberals, conservatives, everybody else. Myth number two, I feel like I'm giving away the plot of the book and then you're not going to buy it. <laughs> but I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, myth number two uh, is that we are paid what we are worth. Now, there is a tautology in, in a sense that there is obvious truth. That is, we are paid what we are worth in the market. But that notion that we're paid what we're worth is also a moral statement. It's understood in moral terms. Uh, uh, somebody, uh, a, a hedge, and I don't want to pick on hedge fund managers, but a hedge fund manager who gets paid a billion dollars a year is assumed to be worth, in some vague moral sense, a billion dollars a year. Somebody who can barely scrape together uh, enough money to live on is assumed, in some moral sense, to be worth very, very little. But of course, that depends, given myth number one, whether the market is organized in a morally justifiable way. If it's not, then there's no moral justification for why somebody is paid one thing or another. And myth number three is that the biggest issue dividing liberals and conservatives has to do with taxing the wealthy and redistributing it. At least the biggest issue other than government versus market. But if you examine the premises closely of first and the second myths I've given you, what you see is that the redistributions outside the market, taxing and redistributing, are actually very small compared to the, what I call, pre-distributions upward inside the market. Now let me just explain that, because I'm reading some of your faces and you just tuned out completely. What I said, what I mean is that when you pay uh, uh, airlines, for example, people come up to me and they ask, why is it that even though fuel prices have dropped dramatically, my airline tickets cost just as much, if not more, than ever before? Well, it has a lot to do with the fact that we had, up until 10 years ago, at least nine major airlines. We now have four major airlines. And through most hubs, there is only one or two. That means there's no competition, which means they can charge basically whatever they want. And that explains a pre-distribution upward from a lot of consumers to a lot of airline companies and their executives and their major shareholders. Or take pharmaceuticals. I mean, you don't have to take pharmaceuticals. <laughs> But take them as an example. I mean, with pharmaceuticals, 
unlike most other com uh, countries, in the United States, we allow proprietary drug manufacturers to pay off generic manufacturers not to produce the generic versions of the drug, uh, even after the patent is gone. And we say it's f pay for delay is perfectly fine. That is illegal in most other wealthy countries, but we allow it. We say you can't get your drugs from can Canada anymore. We say Medicare can't use its huge bargaining power uh, to m reduce drug prices. Now, why do we say all this? Well, because of the political power of the pharmaceutical companies. Well, that is a, amounts to a predistribution upward from all of us to them. Or another example, and I could give you many, I could bore you to tears, uh, internet service. Well, Dara, I don't even have to go on. <laughs> but but let, me just, let me just tell you something you might not know, is that we pay more in this country for internet service than any citizens of any other advanced country, and we have slower internet service than anybody else. Uh, and now why is that? Because 80% of us don't have any choice. We have only one internet service provider. Why is that? Does it have anything to do with politics? Does it have anything to do with the, poli the, the political power of the internet service providers, both in the, at the federal level, at the local level, at the state level? Of course it does. And so on. These pre-distributions inside the market are huge. And yet, we don't know about them. They are hidden. So those three myths taken together are blocking us from having the kind of discussions we need to be having here in the United States. And it's not really Republican, Democrat, or liberal versus conservative. It really is most of us. And I want, I'm, I'm now I have to be very careful because I was just about to use the term versus. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not most of us versus a small elite at the top. It's most of us who are basically redistributing or, or pre-distributing upward, uh, we need to get together politically. Uh, I walk through airports. I, this morning I came down from Boston, and it happened again. When I walk through airports, uh, because I'm fairly conspicuous, people, you know, I'm, I'm very short, and some people recognize me, and people come up to me who I don't know, strangers, and they come up to me and say things, like this morning, somebody came up, a uh, complete stranger, and said, so what are we going to do? <laughs> uh, and two days ago, I was in the Newark airport on this book tour, and some, again, a complete stranger came up and said, can you believe it? <laughs> now, now, I want to, I mean, put yourself in my place. You know, you have people, I have, I, and I, by, the, by now I know what's going on, but it's, it's an odd experience, because it's as if I've been, I'm in a continuous, free-floating conversation <laughs> with people who are distressed. And it's the distress that I want to focus on for a minute. Because most of these communications are really about feelings of powerlessness. People who are basically saying, I can't do anything, and what's going on, and politics is out of control, and the economy is, is crazy and off track, and sometimes they say to me, I'm working harder than ever, and getting nowhere, and my kids are not going to live as well as I am, or what, whatever combination of things that you might consider, and most of you feel it, I'm sure. Most people do feel it. It's that sense of frustration and powerlessness. And I think a lot of it has to do with what I have been talking about. The political economy does seem rigged. It does seem fundamentally unfair that certain people are earning what they are, and a lot of us are not. And also, we don't understand the pre-distributions upward, but we have a sense that something is wrong in terms of how the market is organized. Uh, I dedicated this book to my mentor named John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, I did it for a very specific reason, because John Kenneth Galbraith wrote a book, some of you may remember, in 1952. It was called American Capitalism, and the subtitle was The Concept of Countervailing Power. And briefly, Galbraith's thesis was that the reason our 
political economy was working as well as it was in the 50s, and he elaborated a little bit in the 60s, was because we had a balance in our political economy. The, the big power of the big banks and the big corporations, and even, although he didn't put it this way, the very wealthy, was balanced, counterbalanced, by countervailing power in our society. Counter, what kind of countervailing power? Well, small businesses that gain some protection from the New Deal. Also, farm cooperatives versus big agriculture. Also, state and local banks vis-a-vis -vis Wall Street. They were also protected by New Deal legislation. And also, labor unions that counterbalanced the power of big corporations. And he said that the major legacy of the New Deal when you consider all of this countervailing power, what's the creation and enabling of the countervailing power sources to actually aggregate and be more powerful? What has happened over the last 35 years is that all of these sources of countervailing power have withered so that we no longer have the balance we once had. And it seems to me the fundamental political challenge, people say, ask me, you know, well, what, if you, want to, if you want to make the economy work for everybody and if you want to uh, improve politics, what do you do? And I usually say back, well, get big money out of politics. Uh, but then that's kind of a chicken and egg issue because how do you get big money out of politics if big money controls everything and won't let you get big money out of politics? Now, you see, you always get back to the chicken and egg problem unless you posit a political movement to gain countervailing power. And then when I talk about this a little bit, uh, in the book, I remember I wrote this book a year, really over a year ago, I said and predicted that the major political divide over the next 10, 15, 20 years in America would not be Republican versus Democrat or even liberal versus conservative. It would be anti-establishment versus establishment. Now, obviously, I had no way of predicting Bernie Sanders and <laughs> perish the thought. I hate to use his name in the same sentence. <laughs> Mr. Trump. But, but the other point that I suggest in the book is that there really are two kinds of anti-establishment politics, historically. One is progressive reform anti-establishment politics of the sort that we had in 1901 to 1916, uh, the progressive era. But the other strand of anti-establishment politics is authoritarian anti-establishment politics. We, in this country, we've had a little bit of it. I mean, uh, we had it, uh, Father Coughlin, during the 1930s. Uh, we have it in terms of, uh, well, other countries have had more experience. Uh, Berlusconi in Italy, uh, before him many years, Mussolini. I don't want to pick on the Italians. <laughs> but but what, the, what the authoritarian strand of anti-establishment or populist politics is all about is really the strong man uh, who says, don't worry, just I'm, I'm powerful enough, just get behind me, I'll do it. This is Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom. And when people are angry enough and frustrated enough and upset enough, they tend to either be ready for major progressive reform, and in this country we have done it four times before, or they fall, not often in this country, but in other countries, for authoritarian anti-establishment populism. And it seems to me that Maybe not in 2016, but certainly in 2020 and in future years, that is going to be the major choice. So I, as I go around the country, and I, I have to just tell you one more little anecdote, and that is I have, t I have two, two kids, two boys. They're not boys anymore, they're young men. Uh, one is an academic. And the other is in show business. He's in Los Angeles, and he does. Uh, has anybody here ever heard of CollegeHumor.com? <laughs> All right, that's his. That's his. Uh, 
<laughs> Most of you don't know it. I don't know it either. I have never heard of it. Uh, but, about, but about four years ago, uh, his name is Sam. He's the younger of the two. Sam came up to me and said, Dad, I, I admire the fact you write books. Uh, but if you want to reach my generation, uh, y you're not going to reach us through books. You've got to reach us through videos and movies. And uh, we're, we're just, we, we just speak a slightly different language. And I was depressed for about two months after he said that. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I decided to, you know, uh, Jake Kornbluth and I made a movie called Inequality for All, and then I've, I've been doing a lot of videos with Jake and, and little drawings, and, uh, and I, I do hear from young people. I mean, young people have no idea that I've ever written anything. Uh, I don't want to say that's, that paints with too, too broad a brush. Uh, but, 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 but the videos and the, and the, and the movie uh, do have uh, a little bit of an influence. Uh, I'm optimistic, by the way, about the future. I'm not pessimistic. I'm optimistic. And my optimism comes really from a few sources. Number one is that I know history. And I know that in the 1830s, and again between 1901 and 1916, and again in the 1930s, and again to some extent in the 1960s, and I was there, this country expanded the circle of prosperity and we made the economy and politics work better. And we will do it again. We do not fall into fascism or communism or totalitarianism. We, when we understand the nature of a problem, tend to be very pragmatic as a people. We roll up our sleeves and get on with whatever has to be done. We've done it four times before. We will do it again. The other source of my optimism is that I spend most of my days with people between the ages of 18 and 25. Now, when you are teaching and you are surrounded by young people who are idealistic and are determined, uh, public service oriented, now they don't like politics. I have to worry and work with them about politics. But they are so inspiring that I cannot help myself but be inspired. They are the future. And the third reason for my optimism is I don't like the alternative. <laughs> uh, so I tell them what I'm going to tell you right now, and that is that cynicism is understandable about politics. I get it. But if we are giving up on politics, we're giving up on democracy. And if we give up on democracy, we basically give up on everything. We let the moneyed interests have it all. And we give our children and their children no legacy of potential constructive reform at all. Which means we all have to be even more engaged than we are now. And we have to build a new, a system of countervailing power. Thank you. And let me just say, it, it's kind of warm in here, and uh, if, uh, if you want to walk around or leave, uh, <laughs> I don't want you to. I want you to buy my book, but that would be all right. But I do want to take your questions. So um, let me have your questions, and I will listen to them, and I'll try to repeat them so everybody can hear them. Yes, all the way in the back. Um, if I could just interrupt for just a second. I do have a mic back here, so if you have a question, I'm going to hand it to you. Okay? C Candace, you were a disembodied voice just there. I don't know where... <laughs> Where you were. Oh, here. So we have a uh, so so the microphone. So wait till the microphone comes to you, and then yes. Hi. Um, I heard about this event like oh, an hour ago, and I jumped on every form of public transportation I could find. <laughs> um, I'm repping the University of Maryland pretty hard, and I guess it's the youthful idealism in me. Would you ever consider coming to a University of Maryland campus and speaking the truth to the people there? <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> How many copies of your book would I have to buy to get you to come out <laughs> really soon? <laughs> well, what I'll do is I will, I will give you 300 boxes on consignment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd, I'd like to do that. I, I, the book, to, a book tour, I don't, you know, the publisher decides where I'm going. Yeah. But of course, I'd love to do that. Okay. And I do, I do spend as much time as I can on college campuses mm -hmm. because I really do feel that that is 
the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at the University of Texas two weeks ago, and uh, just wonderful, 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 exciting young people. Thanks. Harvey. Bob. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to reading your book. Um, I read some of the reviews, which are outstanding. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on the rumor that Bernie Sanders wants a very young cabinet, so he's considering you. Um, <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, what do you think about the fact that a lot of the things you think need to be undone are sort of being constitutionalized by the Supreme Court? Corporations are people, Hobby Lobby. So it's not just, it's not mo no longer, you know, changing politicians. It's either changing Supreme Court decisions or the Constitution. And related to that, what do you think about the states, particularly state attorney generals, who sometimes have been the forefront of the movements to do the kind of things you want to do in securities and other areas? Where's the role for the states in, in doing what you're talking about? Uh, well, obviously, if, if you think about the rules that I am suggesting underpin the market, those rules are coming from legislatures and administrative agencies and courts, uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, those rules, many of them over the last 30 years, one of the reasons we have the kind of inequality and insecurity we have is because those rules have been biased. Now, how do we overcome that? I do believe, and again, a countervailing political power is necessary, and it should be across the board. I'm, uh, I, I want to answer your question, but I also, it reminds me of something that I, w that I hadn't said that I want to say. Uh, I have spent a great deal of time over the last few, few years seeking out people who describe themselves as conservatives and Republicans and talking with them. I tell my students the only way of learning anything is to find people who disagree with you. Uh, but that's not the only reason I talk to them. I'm, I'm interested in how they are seeing reality and also where there is an overlap. And there are remarkable degrees of overlap. That is, most of the Tea Party conservatives I come across want to bust up the big banks on Wall Street. Most of the Tea Party conservatives I come across are opposed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Most of them, and again, this is not, you know, I, I mean, this, this is random. I mean, I, I'm coming across, it's not that I'm saying, I'm going out and saying, could I please have any Tea Party conservative who agrees with me or is likely to agree with me? Um, I can give you a whole list. Uh, corporate welfare, uh, you know, crony capitalism. I, there are so many issues where there is a complete symmetry and it strikes me that that's the beginning of the kind of countervailing power we need. Uh, and a state, a state attorneys general, uh, many of them are elected. Many state judges are elected. And that process is very corrupting, particularly when you've got big money. Uh, and that's, again, where we need uh, the kind of countervailing power. Uh, finally. Uh, I was interested that Bernie Sanders said, uh, I think three days ago, uh, he's going to appoint Supreme Court justices. He's only going to have one litmus test. Now, I don't like litmus, litmus tests. You know, that is a requirement. I don't like litmus tests for judges, and you probably don't either, Harvey. But the one that he spoke of, I do like. That is, the litmus test is reversing Citizens United. Yeah, right. Yes. On, on, on exactly that subject, uh, as a young economist on Capitol Hill in 1975, I went into a brief as senator. Oh, I'll, I'll repeat. I'll repeat. No, just talk into the mic. Just talk into the yeah, mic. Well, I am. You were saying, as a young economist in 1975, I, I went into, you remember yeah, I do. the old I, days. Well, I, 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 I went in to brief a, a senator on the cost of his amendment to the tax code and was kind of surprised to see an envelope of $100 bills sitting on his desk. So I shortened that up. But I would argue that we're actually more corrupt now because our elected officials spend a minimum of one day a week campaign, doing campaign finance, including the President of the United States. It's, a, 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 it's, so, it's inherently corrupting. So, it's inherently so, corrupting. So how do we get out of this? I mean, is Citizens United, that's just the first step. Well, as I said before, you get into a chicken and egg 
quickly unless you're talking in, cra in very, very specific political terms. Right. Uh, and the only way to do that is through you know, a movement. I, I, I chair a citizens group called Common Cause. Uh, when I'm, anybody here Common Cause yeah, member? Sure. Uh, and uh, that's been going, that was founded by John Gardner, a Republican, 40 years ago. Uh, and it has really made, for 40 years, its objective to get big money out of politics. Talk about failing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, had it not been for Common Cause, we would not have McCain-Feingold, we wouldn't have had a lot of things that we need. Uh, we're never going to get a pure politics, money out of politics, uh, but the progressives actually passed the first money out of politics bill, as you may recall. Uh, it said no corporation can provide any money for any political campaign. That was in 1904. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a continuous battle, but it can only be won if people are really riled up and behind it. And, this, and the money that you referred to uh, on the desk of your legislature in 1975, well, the robber barons of the 1890s, uh, they were, their lackeys were depositing sacks of money onto the desks of pliant legislators. I mean, it was, it was, it was absolutely in the open. Uh, and then the public did rise up. Hello. Yes. Oh, you have a microphone. Yes. Uh, because of my contacts with some Tea Party... You have, you have to talk into the microphone, or I, I have I to repeat what you're saying. get much closer without swallowing it. <laughs> yes. That's okay. I, ask your question, and I'll repeat the question. Okay. Because of my contacts with some Tea Party friends, I can't share your optimism uh, <laughs> about what's going to happen. The reason being, your first myth that you mentioned about the market versus... It, cuts off any other thinking in their minds. It trumps the areas of agreement you talk about. Uh, about it trumps. <laughs> I, I should, <laughs> should pick up a different verb, but uh, well, uh, it uh, co-ops. Yeah, it does. And this is why it's so important for you to buy the book for them. Well, it, this gets to what I want to ask. This gets because, to what I because, but no, I no, I'm, 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 I'm being, I'm not being facetious. I, 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 I wrote the book so that we could get out of these uh, ridiculous debates that bear no semblance to reality. The people who speak loudest in favor of this mythology, the market versus government, are those who have the most to gain from people not facing the underlying reality. I'm not sure. The Tea Party people I know are not wealthy. They are against their own interests and in they're thinking about being for... Uh, exactly. They're not. That's precisely my point. They are... They are consistently voting against their economic interests because they've been sold a bill of goods about you don't trust government, don't, let's not trust government, let's trust the private market, or everybody has paid what they're owed. No. I was, when, we, when I, uh, few of us did this movie, Inequality for All, one of those moving scenes for me was in a union, uh, there was going to be a union election, and I was, uh, I was talking to a bunch of workers who were trying to decide whether to vote for a union or against it, and I came across uh, a, a fellow who was maybe 30 years old, and he said, I don't want a union, and I said, why not? He said, well, I don't deserve any more money than I'm getting. <laughs> And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because I don't have the brains. You see, he had internalized a set of mythologies. I know, I know a lot of people have. My question specifically is, I have a friend that uh, reads your blog all the time and brings it to my attention, for which I'm grateful. But he thinks you should, in order to publicize your ideas and the book, that you should run for president <laughs> for that purpose, to publicize. Your ideas, not because you have a chance of winning, but to publicize your ideas. You know, a book tour is hard enough. <laughs> um, I could interrupt. I've got one in the back here. Okay, we have one in the back. Right. Sure. Yep. Professor Raj, you mentioned recently that uh, talked about a minimum income, not just a minimum wage, but yep. a minimum income. Uh, recently, there was a, a, a vote in, in Switzerland for such a thing. It would have cost 30 percent of GDP and they, each citizen would get $2,700 a month. If we look at the, how productive we are and how, how we ship the, the labor-intensive things offshore, uh, how agriculture, was this, which was the way we soaked up as to excess manpower for millennia, has been robotized and 
you know, 2% grow all the food and 4% deliver it. Do you, and we get countries like Sweden now talking about six hour days because is there enough productive work going into the future or yeah. are we so productive that, you know, we will have minimum incomes and we expand how we right, take care right. of people well, from Social Security backwards? I'm going to cut you off because I know exactly where you're going and I agree with you. And I'm going to explain where you're going because I have a chapter, two chapters in the book on why we need a minimum basic income. Uh, and the argument is that precisely, as you began to say, we are moving toward an economy in which instead of mass production for mass consumption, which was our 20th century economy, in which workers were consumers, consumers were workers, and it's sort of, you know, the, the circulation from production to worker and back to uh, the purchasing of all the things that were being produced uh, actually worked pretty well. Henry Ford, not a great man in many respects, uh, but he did kind of understand that principle. Uh, but that principle is now being uh, dissolved uh, with technology. Uh, WhatsApp, you know, the technology, the messaging technology, uh, was sold to Facebook last year for $19 billion. WhatsApp has 550 million clients or customers, and WhatsApp, at the time of the sale, had, again, 450 million customers, but only 55 employees. The ratio of the number of people who are working to the number of people who are actually being served is, is just getting unbelievably low, and that means that we are eventually moving toward what I call an I-everything economy. Uh, by that I mean that if you extrapolate, we're going to have little, little, tiny, tiny, maybe inch-square, high-powered, 3D production systems that will be like modern Aladdin's lamps. I mean, you could, you'll be able to say to this little eye everything, whatever you want, and it'll be, it'll just appear. Uh, but which is wonderful. It, it kind of, it, it will produce the world that John Maynard Keynes in 1928 predicted would happen in a hundred years. That is, there'd be no reason for anybody to work because we will have the technology to do everything that is needed and nobody will have to work. The problem with the I everything that I've just posited is that nobody will be able to buy it because nobody will have any money. <laughs> so what Keynes left out of his vision is a way of making sure that there is enough money being circulated in the economy so people really have the wherewithal to buy. And that's why some sort of minimum basic income is critically important. How do we finance it? Well, there's a very simple way. Instead of going the way of taxing and redistributing, think about reorganizing the market slightly. What do I mean? Well, here I'm going to give away the plot I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay, I will do it. Um, so, w for example, if, if, the, if patents on technology lasted instead of 20 years or 30 years, la they lasted three years, let's say, WhatsApp would not have been worth $19 billion. WhatsApp would have been worth a very tiny fraction of $19 billion. Now, it, uh, it's true that the makers of WhatsApp might not have had as much incentive to create it, but isn't there a way of reducing the monopoly that a patent or intellectual property owners have, or slightly, alternatively, isn't there a way of providing the public with about a certain percentage of the revenues that come from an intellectual property regime that is protected by the government, and using those revenues to recirculate into a minimum basic income? I lost half of you just now, <laughs> so you'll have to read the book. Other questions? Yeah, hi. Um, two issues I'd like to raise. Uh, the first is that this has been going on since the basic founding of our country. In other words, when the Constitution was written, 
there were certain persons within the convention itself, I believe it was Governor Morris of Pennsylvania, who was highly responsible for I'll repeat it. If you can't hear, I'll repeat the question. Okay. So um, I'll talk louder, too, if that helps. So my point is... Well, that if you get to the... I'm, I don't mean to cut you off, but because there are, are a lot though. of people... I am cutting you off. Well, let me finish. I, that's impolite of me, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, let me finish. I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. So, Do so you want to finish your thoughts? And then... <laughs> Ask me the question. Okay, please don't interrupt. Let me get to I the won't, question. I won't, I won't. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So my first point is that this has been well established within our political economic system from the beginning. Okay, that's the first issue. So we need constitutional examination of what's going on, checks and balances on special interests, for example. Okay. The second issue I wanted to raise was that when we go through reforms, such as uh, Roosevelt or any other periods, a lot of the large aggregates of wealth and power have a way of maintaining themselves through the change. And a lot of that is due to the fact that the reforms that we get never really go deep. They go sufficient for the moment, but they don't go deep enough to sort of get at these <laughs> fundamental aggregates of wealth and power. So those are the two things I'm very concerned about. If we're going to do the reforms this time, let's do them right, and let's figure out how this has sustained itself through long periods of history. And your question? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, well, you're, I think you're absolutely right. But the, the four periods that I select uh, in the book, and uh, this is not a history book, but I just make reference to them. The 1830s, that 1901, 1916 progressive period, the 1930s, and to a little limited extent, the 1960s, are periods in which we did reorganize uh, the economy and our politics. Now, you're right. Uh, the, the forces of, uh, of power and wealth uh, did come back. It wasn't a permanent reorganization. It's never going to be a permanent reorganization. It means vigilance. It means uh, a public, as the founders of the republic really did envision, a, a, a public that is continuously organized and vigilant. Now, that in turn requires that we reconstitute or create new systems of countervailing power. When I was labor secretary, one thing that I worried most about in terms of the decline of labor unions is not just that p average working people were losing bargaining leverage, but we were losing the political countervailing power represented by labor unions uh, in terms of our overall power structure in America. And that was a, you know, that unfortunately proved to be a, a correct worry. Now, I don't know whether labor unions are necessarily the only vehicle. Other countries have slightly different vehicles. If you look at Germany, for example, the median wage is much higher than it is in purchasing power parity here. The top 1% doesn't carry nearly as much away in terms of the total economy. There is much more job security, income security. Uh, well, income, uh, you know, labor unions are more powerful, but there are a lot of other things that are going on there constitutionally and institutionally. I think we have time for probably two more questions, and I've got one in the back over here. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I have a question for you, uh, re your expertise as Secretary of Labor. Um, the new statement about the uh, contractors versus employees thing, I'm wondering how you think that can be enforceable um, without totally tanking someone's career, because I'm a contractor, for example, and there's a lot of people in my field that are also contractors, mostly women, too, so it's extra fun because none of us have benefits or maternity leave for my baby here. Um, so how do we go about, you know, actually confronting that without losing our jobs or not getting rehired in the industry because they just say, well, if we can't have contractors, we can't hire anybody, so too bad for you. Uh, well, the, the question you're raising, again, is one of those chicken and egg. I could give you a policy prescription, which I've written about, and that is what we need to do is have a very simple rule that says uh, any employer who is responsible for more than 50% of somebody's pay or more than 50% of the time on the job is 
we say per se or uh, is, is assumed to be uh, presumptively uh, the employer for the purposes of all of the labor protections that somebody is entitled to. Uh, social security, minimum wage, workers' compensation, everything else. What's happened is that many employers are using contracting out as a way of really circumventing all of the labor laws and protections we created in the 20th century. This is a big, important problem. And I could give you that presumptive rule. And I could say to the Labor Department, Labor Department, make those changes. Uh, but it's not that simple. I've been in government, and I know that you can't just say we're changing. You can have the best people in government, but unless good people outside Washington are organized and mobilized to push and make sure those changes are going to happen and they last, you lose. One of the great frustrations I had as Labor Secretary is that it was very hard sometimes to do the things that I thought needed to be done because the public was either not aware of the problem or sufficiently organized. So I agree with you, but as Franklin D. Roosevelt said in 1936 when he was running for re-election, I want to do that, he said to somebody who said, Mr. President, you've got to do this and this and this and this. I will vote for you if you promise to do them. And he said, I will promise to do them, but I will only promise to try to do them. You must make me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now the issue of you must make me is much, much, much more in the forefront of everything that I've talked about. Yeah, and that's just the really hard thing because, you know, individuals have to put themselves on the line to totally uh, give up their economic security to make any kind of difference. Um, and even if you all band together, it's, it's still very intimidating for young uh, graduates to take on an establishment that's hiring them uh, this way and saying that, you know, this is fine. We do this all the time. Well, it's very hard for individuals. I mean, we have a long history in this country of very courageous workers who have put their jobs on the line and their households and their families on the line for the sake of organizing. Uh, it's not easy. I'm not saying that this doesn't require any sacrifice or courage, but it has to happen. Um, the question is uh, a third party. I think that if the two major parties don't respond to the upsurge of, for want of a better term, I'll call it populism, uh, then we are going to have a third party. Mm -hmm. But I think the history in this country is that one of the two parties do does co-opt, uh, sometimes in a very positive way, uh, these uh, this this upsurge. So do we have time for okay one, one more, more question? Yeah, this might this be is the last one of question. Those questions to interrupt. But, so this um, better be a really <laughs> concise. What do you want? Break I don't want to put any pressure on you, but this has to this be. This guy's got a question too, so no, mine I'm, sucks. I'm, he can go step ahead. up. Um, you mentioned uh, history. Your knowledge of history is kind of one of the sources of optimism. You cited uh, these four periods where we widen the circle of prosperity. Um, I can't say my recall of U.S. history is that great, but I know, like you said, at least some of those periods, like the Gilded Age, um, and that led into the Progressive Era, was like, per, you know, they're predated by really extreme levels of economic inequality. I'm just curious if you think we're there yet. I mean, it seems like we <laughs> went through the financial crisis, and there was, you know, really a vigorous kind of outpouring of, you know, just outcry, and it seems like it's kind of been muted at this point. I mean, do you I think, don't that think there's it's something? Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think it's been muted. Okay. Uh, the Tea Party and the Occupy movement both came directly out of the bailout of Wall Street. There is still huge anger out there about that and about what it is viewed as a rigged system. For the first time, I remember we have, we have a presidential candidate who began her candidacy, who announced that she was running by saying the system, the deck is stacked in favor of those at the top. Now, I was there when her husband declared his candidacy in 1992. He would have never, ever said anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have conservatives and who are saying similar kinds of things. Now, I don't mean we can doubt the sincerity. It's not that, that's not the issue. The issue is that, is that they're being advised by their political advisors that that's really powerful stuff, that, people care about. that the people want to hear that. But even still, those two movements that you cited, I mean, I think that they both both have really lost steam these last few years. Is there something like that's actively, I mean, Occupy, 
as diffused. Wall, Tea Party, I don't think, is nearly as... Well, I, I don't think it... it I mean, I think Bernie Sanders is the direct lineal descendant of the Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the tra Tea Party movement has a, a variety of descendants in the current uh, Republican firmament. I'm not suggesting to you uh, that one of them will become president or necessarily should be. I'm just suggesting that there's a, an upspring, a welling up of populist energy such as I have not seen in my lifetime. And it's, uh, it's affecting and changing American politics in a very profound way. Uh, it's not good necessarily, it could be bad. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to stress with you, that that's a choice that we all have to make. Thanks. And uh, on that upbeat note, oh. <laughs> I'm I, my question is really one that is very different than everyone else. And I think I represent a different audience um, of your book and of your readings that I'd really like to ask my question. Well, of. do so. Okay. Um, so earlier you stated that college, a college degree no longer provides upward mobility. However, young individuals like myself who are the first in their family to obtain such a degree because of the optimism that we, by those struck by poverty for generations, see in this degree. Um, what, how do we begin to save the work that they have done, that my family has done to put me where I am um, and how do we begin to save capitalism for that group of individuals, for those who are moving and see education still as a form of moving themselves up in America um, and who have been working Americans for many, many years? First of all, I'm not suggesting that a college education is not worth it. It is worth it. I spend most of my ta time as a professor teaching at one of the best universities in America. UC Berkeley, I'm a UC Santa Cruz, I just graduated. Well, the UC system, what I love about the UC system is that most of my students are the first in their family to go to college. Yes. Uh, and about 35% of my students are Pell Grant eligible, which means they are from rather, rather poor families. Uh, and, you know, I used to teach at Harvard I won't even finish the thought, but you know where I'm going. Uh, so I'm very, look at I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of higher education, but the trends that I am talking about, which are economic and political, and they are absolutely bound up together, yes. can only be reversed if young people get, like yourself, get engaged, actively engaged in politics. Interning at the White House. <laughs> so. Well, that's pretty I good. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. <laughs>